outline as we continue in our study through Christology. In your um, outlines, we're going to be touching on the subject of the incarnation of Jesus Christ and the virgin birth. Uh, Christmas Eve, we're going to do a message on God with us, Emmanuel, God with us. And uh, so we, we're we having a good time with Christology, and I hope that, uh, I know it has been a blessing um, and um, so much stuff to learn. Every time you open that subject, it's like scratching your head, and it's like, uh, Tivor last night asked me, um, he said, Pastor Burr, are you okay? There's something wrong with you because you're always laughing and making jokes and things. And you seem to be a little bit worried or something. I go like, I'm teaching on the incarnation of Jesus Christ tomorrow. So I've been having nightmares and all kinds of other stuff and migraines because it's not an easy subject. And then he started laughing at me and I go like, thanks a lot. <laughs> that really helps. No, he didn't. So... But uh, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, I mean, we take on this subject, and, and seriously, the incarnation of Jesus Christ is fundamental, is foundational to the Christian faith. We're going to see a lot of stuff here. Uh, I just want to give you a warning before we get into it. Don't feel discouraged if you come to a point when you say, like, I don't understand this thing, because I don't understand this thing, okay? Um, it's not an easy thing. However, I, I think I can help you a little bit with saying this. Whenever you come to a subject in the Bible that is not really clear as to the method, why, uh, what methodology was God using to do these things, you might not understand the method, try to understand the means. What is he trying to accomplish with that? And then everything is going to take more clarity and it's going to be uh, easier in a sense to not, not understand but to believe by faith. Remember, a lot of these things we take by faith. You know, why, why some of these things, like why does God allow suffering? Why those little babies have to, you know, get sick with cancer? Why good people die? We don't understand those things. And I don't think we will understand those things here. You know, what is it, why is it that evil people get away with all kinds of evil things? But at the end of all things, what do we know about the Bible? What do we know about Jesus? What do we know about the, the ultimate purpose is redemption. That he loves us so much. And he says it clearly in the Bible. For God so, lo so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And then he provides everlasting life. And then he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he says, I have come that you will have life and that more abundantly. We, we understand that part. Getting there, it might be difficult. It might be dark. It might be uh, discouraging. It's, it might be all of that. However, he says, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so we trust in that. And by faith, we take a step of faith and we say, Lord, I'm closing my eyes. I'm stretching out my hand, and I know that your righteous right hand will always sustain me. You are the creator. You are the sustainer of all these things. And it comes to that. And you know that as we get old, we get to that point when we said, now it's really the matter of living by faith. It's not about what I see, but what I hear. And I can always trust that he is with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come to uh, take these subjects that are perhaps so difficult, so tough and so heavy. There's so much depth here. There's so much theology, so much understanding here. And yet we believe that all of those things you want us to take it from the simple perspective. My God is with me and he not only tells me what he's doing, but he's making it happen. And he will take me and I will fear no evil. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For my God, my shepherd, my good shepherd is with me. And he knows me. And so, Father, we come to these topics, to these subjects with that understanding. And by faith, we believe that all these things that are written are written for our instruction. And so, God, teach us, we pray. Open our eyes to see. Open our ears to hear, but more important, open our hearts to receive this truth, as difficult as it is, that, that this truth will transform our thinking, our way of living, that indeed our belief will determine our behavior, for it is all about you and your presence with us. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we'll see you next week. No. <laughs>
chapter 9 in the book of Isaiah. I'm going to read this verse here because <clears throat> from these, you, you, you watch, from here we're going to have a, a, a more like a clear understanding of what he's going to say throughout this whole thing in, in, in the subject of the incarnation. It says in Isaiah chapter 9, for unto us a child is born, we know that, uh, <clears throat> that will be the humanity of Jesus Christ. We've been talking about this text for a long time already. For unto us a child is born, but then here's the, the other, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. So a child will be born that indeed is none other than the son that will be given, and this one son is very unique, very special, because the government will be upon his shoulders. Now this son can be described with this uh, uh, attribute. His name will be called Wonderful. He is a counselor, and he is mighty God. He is, at the same time, everlasting father, just as he is the child that is born. is everlasting father. And then, last but not least, he is also a prince of peace. So from that point, from that perspective, listen, everything we have to say about the incarnation today is with that end. That there will be a man, there will be a child, a child that was given to us, a son that was given to us, and the purpose that he was given to us was that the government will be upon his shoulder, and he will be all of this. When you take those attributes here, and those qualifications, those descriptions of him, that it has to do with everything, everything that has to do with life as we know it. And so, going from that point of perspective, we take on the subject of incarnation. What is the incarnation of Jesus Christ? What does it have to do with that? Incarnation is a term that, was, that has been used by theologians for many, many, many years to indicate a divine act by which God, the Son, the second person of the Trinity, the Son becomes human flesh like us. That is incarnation. The second person of the Trinity, the second person of the triune God who took on human flesh. We get that from John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 14. If you want to go there, you can go there and you can read it with me. Gospel of John, chapter 1. You there? You're not there? Dun, 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 dun. Gospel of John, chapter 1. Verse 14, the word incarnation is not in the Bible, but the concept of incarnation is all over the place when we look at the humanity of Jesus Christ. But if there's one verse that we get the word incarnation from, it was in the Latin translation of this verse here in chapter 1 in the Gospel of John, verse 14, and the word became flesh. Incarnation means becoming flesh. So that's what it's all about. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The word is, is a, a person, and it says here, this person is Jesus, and we beheld his glory. The glory has the only begotten of the Father, and this man, Jesus, was full of grace and full of truth. And so we know that is the case because in chapter 1, verse 1 says this, in the beginning was the word. You can just imagine when John is writing this verse. And the, the first time that this verse will be out in public. As they are reading this verse. When the moment he says, in the beginning, immediately the Jewish mind gets up and he pays attention. Because we know another place where this in the beginning is mentioned. Isn't it? And it takes us all the way to Genesis chapter 1. But then he says something here. In the beginning was the word. The moment he said the word, then all the Greek philosophy of uh, philosophers of his days, they all pay attention because the word was a term that was used so much in philosophy in those days. So the one verse gets not only the Gentiles' attention, but also the Jewish mind attention. And so John says, now, now that, you, that I have your attention, let me tell you who, I'm, who am I talking about. I'm talking to you about the word. What, what, what is he saying about the word? The word who was with God. And when he says with God, mean, meaning same as God, with God, being equal with God. And so 
In the beginning was the Word, who was God, and the Word was God, who was with God, and the Word was God. So, all bunch of uh, uh, theological things here, but the term that we are going to be concerned about today, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And how, by that uh, doctrine, by that teaching, we come to uh, a closer understanding of Jesus Christ. Two things about Jesus Christ. You have to know the person of Jesus Christ. Who is he? And that's what we're trying to accomplish here with, with Christology. Two important things that as a Christian, you have to know and you have to get them under your belt and you have to mark them in your Bible and you have to go over and over and over. Always, whenever you talk to someone about Jesus, whenever someone brings the conversation about Jesus, there have to be two things that always are highlighted. Number one, his person. Who is he? And you have to be able to use all these chapters and all these verses and go back to these things. Jesus, who is he? And the second thing is, what did he do? If you get those two things, you're going to be a solid Christian. And no one is going to deceive you. No one is going to confuse you. Jesus? We talk about Jesus? Yeah. Do you know who he is? Well, kind of like that. Well, let me tell you what the Bible says about Jesus. There you go. Who is he? And now that you know and you establish who is he, now you, you can easily go and determine what did he do? The person of Jesus Christ and the work of Jesus Christ. And all of that have to do, listen, all of that is a, is a beautiful way to begin to understand this concept, this, this, this teaching, this doctrine that we call the Trinity. The Trinity is a beautiful subject and it's a beautiful topic. It's a beautiful thing to study in the Bible. Though the word Trinity is not in the Bible. But let me tell you, the teaching of it is all over the place, beginning in Genesis. And so, so you take this Trinity. What is about the Trinity? Well, the Trinity is not only that God, listen, that God cares and he is concerned and he reveals himself. Because we have a Trinity, we have a God who reveals himself. How does he reveal himself? In the person of Jesus Christ. If we don't have a trinity, it will be difficult. I mean, think about the other gods of the other religious uh, uh, of the other religions in the world. It's just something out of their imagination. Yet we have in the trinity, we have God, the Son, who reveals Himself and reveals to us everything about God. He comes and He says, "You see me? You see my Father." And then He says, "I and the Father, we are what." We're one. And so that's the beautiful thing about the Trinity. And so when you do this, so, so if, if, if the Trinity is about, about God revealing himself, how is he going to do it? The second part of that is, is the God who redeems. The Trinity talks about a God who reveals himself and a God who redeems. It's talking about revelation and it's talking about redemption. How is he going to do that? Again, you, took, you, you, you take those things that you know and you look at the end purpose, at the, what he's trying to achieve, and you go like, okay, now that I know what he's trying to do, it's easy for me to backtrack and to see where he came from and, and what is he doing. In your Bibles, turn to chapter 4 in the book of Galatians, please. If, if you think that you're getting a headache, just go like this and we're going to get you a cup of coffee. No sugar, no nothing. I had about two gallons of coffee this morning, and so, so when, when you hear my Bible going like, ah, that's what it is, okay? But it's, it's just beautiful. I mean, it's, it's, there's nothing more, uh, I, don't, I don't know about you, but there's nothing more, even when you come to, you know, a time of Bible study and you start writing papers and all of that, and you, you write something, and that doesn't make sense, boom, it goes in the trash. And it, No, it doesn't make sense, it goes in the trash. And before you know, you have a, this much paper that you're wasting away, it's just like, I didn't get so much out of it, but one thing I do know, it is just beautiful to, st to spend time reading the Word of God. For none of that is in vain. Trust me, none of that is in vain. Galatians chapter 4. Now this will be Paul the Apostle. And it is such a beautiful way. He's going to give us the end purpose. What, what, what was God trying to achieve with this subject we call the incarnation? Galatians tells us that clearly in verse 4. He said this. Galatians 4 verse 4. But when the fullness of the time had come. <laughs> the fullness of the time. That immediately tells you that the one person who's doing this is in absolute control of time. Which has to be someone who is amazing. Who else can be in control of time? 
It has to be someone who's majestic, someone who is amazing, someone who is awesome in control, in power, and all that. In the fullness of time, when the fullness of time has come, God sent forth his son, and this one son is going to be born of a woman. And not only that, it's going to be born of a woman, but it's going to be born under the law. I mean, immediately you start like writing these things and, oh, you talk about the law, you go all the way back to Leviticus and then you have to jump all the way to Exodus and then from there you have to go back to Genesis. How, how was it that this thing was given to us? And you're going back and forth and you go back and forth. You go Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and oh, Galatians and Romans and justification and salvation. Oh, this is just beautiful. What did I get out of that? Not much, but it's beautiful. Why is beautiful? Because look at the promise. This one son, unique, very special, is going to be born of a woman. One, two, is going to be under the law. And what is he going to do? Verse 5. Here's when everything is becoming uh, clear and, and just beautiful. Why is he going to do that? Oh, he's going to do that to redeem those who were under the law. Oh. For what purpose? He's going to redeem. What is the word redeem? What's the meaning of redeem? What's the, re what's the meaning of redemption? What is redemption about? To what? To buy back. To bring back, to buy, to purchase back to you. So he says he's going to do that to, to, to buy back those who were under the law so that they might receive what? Adoption as sons. That's the beautiful way that, that, that the Holy Spirit will put these things. I believe God had always the intention that the Bible will be simple. So that it will touch on the simplicity of the mind. And yet at the same time it will praise the majesty of his wisdom. The majestic his ways. In the simplicity of what is written for the simple mind who by faith believes that wow. In the fullness of time, not before, not after. So, how did he go about doing all of these things? Now, now we have to go all the way back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, please. Genesis 3. I told the first service that I was going to take my time. If he gets that we are here until like 2024, 2025 with the same subject, that's okay. I'm okay with that. As long as you're not mad at me. Because you know what? The, the one thing we don't want to do is to take these things lightly. These are foundational truths. Uh, truth, uh, this is foundational truth here, and we want to take all the time. Now, in Genesis chapter 3, you know that in chapter 2, verse 17, the Lord says to Adam and Eve, he says, here's the deal. Out of the tree of the knowledge of evil, the good and evil, you should not eat. For the day, on the day that you eat out of it, you should surely die. So that was a clear instruction. It was just, just clear cut. Don't eat out of it. If you do eat out of it, you will die. What did they do? It's exactly what they, they, were, they were told not to. After that, here are the consequences, the repercussions of their disobedience. And so <clears throat> in chapter 3 of the book, book of Genesis, actually, I'm going to read verse 9. Then the Lord God called Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman you gave me to be with me. She gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you're cursed more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. But here's the, the beautiful part of that, verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. My question to you, church, what woman is this? I will put enmity between you. Who is the you? The serpent. And who is the woman? Who is the woman? Uh, na, na, na. Who is the woman? 
The church, no. No, it's not Israel. Who's, who's in the media? Remember what, what I always say? Context, context, context. Who is in the immediate context here? It, yeah, the, it, it, he, he's addressing Adam, the serpent, and who else? Oh, so, so this is the woman. Now you say, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. How can, how can he be that? Because, he, uh, uh, you know, kids, and which one of the kids is he talking about here? He said, Out of, uh, in, in plain language, it says to Eve, your descendant, your seed, and the descendant and the seed, or the seed of the serpent, there will be an enmity. The descendant of the serpent, he says, it is going to be uh, this conflict with your descendant. And then he says this, between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you, he, that singles out all of the other kids. It has to be just one. Now he's, he's naming this in the singular. It's important because Eve had not just one son. Did she? No, she has several. But out of the several kids that she will have, one, it says here, will be the one that he saw. Now we know for sure that this is a prophecy that has a fulfillment in the future. Right? But in the immediate context, he's addressing the women. He says, and, you shall, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And so, here is the whole thing. This is what is called the Proto-Evangelion in the book of Genesis, the first mention of the gospel in the book of Genesis. What does that have to do with incarnation? Well, here's the prophecy. Here's the prophecy that tells us, put that together with Galatians chapter 4, and you're like, uh-huh, now I get it. I understand this. The in-between methodology that God is going to use is probably not going to be that clear cut to me, but I know where it comes from, and I know what is going to achieve at the end. What is the purpose of this prophecy? You see what I'm saying? And so when you get that, it's easy to do that. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 7. <clears throat> and it keeps uh, just reinstating this promise, this prophecy, and, and it will have its fulfillment in the New Testament, of course, we know. But not just in the times of Jesus, but it has a fulfillment way in the future still. The, the, but the Lord keeps repeating these things as for our instruction. Chapter 7 in the book of Isaiah, beginning in verse 4. Now, you know that this is a time of great turmoil. During the days of Isaiah, there's a lot of political unrest, and there's a lot of stuff going on, and Isaiah and the king are going to have this conversation. What's going to happen? How is, he, how is he going to deliver us? How is he going to make sure that, that to the throne of David, he had made the promise that out of the, uh, out of the throne of David, out of the descendants of David, will be one who will occupy the throne of David forever. And now they're come to a point when that is shaking and that is at risk. And it says, no, 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 he, the Lord will do this. Verse 14, chapter 7 says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. What well, will be this sign that the Lord is doing something? The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, pay attention, look, stop everything and watch this closely. Observe carefully. The Lord will give you this sign that you have to observe carefully. The virgin, notice that it says, The virgin shall, con shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name, what? Emmanuel. Now, if you read that in the, in the, in the, in, with, the, with the Jewish perspective, the Jewish uh, uh, rabbis said that instead of saying here, The virgin, it says the word Alma. Alma means a young lady. They refuse to say that this is a prophecy about the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And for that matter, they much rather use Alma, because Alma means a young woman, a young lady. The problem is that young women getting pregnant is a sign to nothing. It happens all the time. If it was going to be a sign, it had to be supernatural. It has to be something that had never done to be, happened before that is impossible to be repeated. And so that's why the Lord says here, the virgin. It's interesting, because although in, 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 in the Jewish understanding, it said the young women, when the Bible from the Hebrew was translated to the Greek, the word they used to say the virgin is partenos. Partenos means 
virgin, and only means virgin. It had to be a sign. Why is it a sign? Because a virgin should not get pregnant. She's a virgin. She had had no intimacy with no man. That's why she remains a virgin, and she, she, she should not get pregnant. And so here's, here's, here's the implication of all of that. The translation to the Greek says, the partenos, the virgin. Go to Gospel, uh, Gospel of Matthew chapter 1. What is occupying our minds is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And all of these verses go with that so that our understanding. Paul said it clearly. He says, I want that your understanding be not from the wisdom of men, but through the power of the scriptures, through the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're trying to accomplish here. Gospel of Matthew chapter 1 verse 18 you there? Is what it says here. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed through Joseph, before they came together, it's important to underline that, before they came together. What's it saying here? Before they actually had what? Intimacy. Before they actually had intimacy, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, in a just man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus means Yahweh is salvation. You should call his name Yahweh is salvation. For he will save his people from their sins. So all of this was done. Check this out. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. What prophet was this? Isaiah. Verse 23. Saying, verse 23, behold, the virgin. What's the word there? The partenos. The virgin. The virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Amazing how that thing is taking place. Now, turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. It's our intention to follow just what the Bible says. Pastor Chuck used to say, simply the word, simply the Bible. Chapter 1. And this is an amazing, amazing chapter here as well. Chapter 1, verse 26. You're there? Now in the sixth month... The angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David the virgin's name was Mary and having come in the angel said to her rejoice highly favored one the lord is with you blessed are you among women but when she saw him she was troubled as at his saying, and consider what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now, from here to verse 35, a whole bunch of theological implications. Highlight them, underline them, uh, write them, do something with them, because they are important here. Verse 31, And behold, you will conceive in your womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Notice this. He will be great, and will be called the son of the highest. Now, Matthew didn't say that. But look here, because he's a doctor, he gives us details. Upon details, and a bunch of details, he will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. His father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be? Since I do not know a man. 
Now, that doesn't mean that she didn't know any men, like in relationship with other guys. No. She said, I have never had intimacy. I have not had intimacy with anybody, any men, for she was still a virgin. Huh. I do not know a man. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. What is the meaning of that? There's so much uh, heresy just out of that verse. They, they said that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and it will be like, like <sighs> it's not even worth mentioning what they said about this thing. What is, the, what is the meaning of the Holy Spirit will come upon you? The Jehovah Witnesses, the, the, the Mormons said that, that it means that, that God actually had intimacy with Mary. So that it, it's, it's, it's just, just, just ridiculous, just evil that we even think of that stuff. That's not what he's saying here. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. We know that the word upon is, it is when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, it means to control. He says, hey, I know, I, I know it's difficult for you to understand. But here, listen, let me tell you, let the Holy Spirit take over from here, yeah? Just trust that the Holy Spirit is in full, absolute control of this whole thing. What thing? That you're going to be pregnant. How can that be? I don't know. I don't, I don't have intimacy with no man. Let the Holy Spirit take over from here, yeah? Just believe that. And, and now it gets, it gets a little bit worse here because it says, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. What, what is that? Hmm. Therefore, also, the Holy One, this baby, this, this, this son, who, by the way, is the son of the highest. He is the son of God by the Holy Spirit that takes over, absolutely over, and that overshadows the whole transaction here. The Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And, and all of these things here. So the, here's, here, here's the version who's going to bring forth the Son. The Son is the Son of the Highest. The Holy Spirit will have an oversee and have full control of this whole thing so that the Son uh, is going to be there by the power of God, and therefore He's going to be holy. The one who is to be born, Son of God, is the Holy Son of God. See, again, what distinguishes Christianity from the rest of all their beliefs in the world is the Trinity. Here you have the Father who is in absolute control of everything, who is preparing this thing for the Son to become flesh so that he can come to live with us. He comes to earth to in human flesh so that he can accomplish redemption for those who were under the law, unable to fulfill the law in a miserable condition, and therefore, by that definition, to be always, uh, Hebrews will say, condemned and under the condemnation of death. And that's the whole point that he's trying to tell us here. Not just of revelation, but the redemption that is implied with all of these things. The incarnation of Jesus Christ is the absolute point of redemption that God in his wisdom and because of his holiness, because of his righteousness, and because of his grace and mercy, he decides that he wants to redeem man who is now under the guilt of sin, under the condemnation of sin, from the very beginning, ever since Adam and Eve, and now we have inherited this sinful nature and the condemnation of that, the wages of sin is what? Death. And that's the whole point that he's trying to. So, so incarnation, a very difficult subject, yes. But what is it? The God in his grace is going to redeem those who are lost, those who are uh, under the condemnation of sin, and he's going to do it by himself, becoming flesh, so that he will be one of us, that he will die for our sin, and he will redeem us back to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 says, God was in Christ Jesus, reconciling the world to himself. What is the meaning of incarnation? The God was in Jesus, reconciling the world to himself. That's incarnation. That's the whole point of it. Now, we need to see other aspects and other details of this, but in, 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 in plain language, that's what incarnation is all about. How do we know that? Well, because Jesus did became flesh. He, he had a human nature. By taking the human nature, does that mean that he stopped being divine? 
Did, 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 did the moment when he took the human nature, did it affect it in any way his divine nature? Absolutely not. Can the two natures uh, 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 exist in one person? Absolutely. How do we know that? Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 11 is going to tell us that, hopefully next week. And so you see all of this. Was he full, fully human? Here's another thing. How many Christians today believe that Jesus was not fully human? He was not fully man. He was like men, but he was not fully man. But the Bible says otherwise. He was a baby. He was growing. And he did things like a baby. And he was growing not only in wisdom, but physically he was growing too. He experienced normal physical growth like other kids. He was hungry. He was tired. He was thirsty. He experienced physical agony. Read Luke's Gospel chapter 22. He was in such deep agony as he was praying at the Garden of Gethsemane. Was he human? Absolutely. Did he cry? Yeah. Were they able to see his tears? Absolutely. Was he human? Of course he was. And so all of these things, when he died, was his, was his dying really a physical death? Oh, absolutely. He died a physical death. When he rose from the dead, was he actually in a physical body? Oh, absolutely. How do we know? But the disciples said, who is he? And he says, look at me. I'm not a ghost. He says, let me show you something. Give me something to eat. And they gave him some fish. And he ate that. Did he have a physical body? Yes, he did. But did he have a physical body, a physical glorified body? Yes, he did. How do we know that? Because he was able to enter this room when the doors were locked. How did he do that? Don't ask me. I don't know. With all the verses in the Bible, still, I cannot explain that. His resurrection involved a physical body, and that's what the Bible said. Were they able to touch him? Yes, absolutely. That's what he said to Thomas. Here, touch me. Put your finger here. And so the humanity of Jesus Christ is well explained in the Bible, which is a confirmation that he did become flesh. That John, John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 14, is true, and it actually did happen. So, so God from the beginning said there will be one who will come and be flesh and he will be the one redeeming all men who were under the condemnation of sin. And that's the whole point of incarnation. That's what Galatians chapter 4 is telling us. It was necessary. First, it was necessary for him to be born under the law. Why? Because him, Jesus, in his righteousness will fulfill Everything perfectly about the law. He says, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. Was it, was it possible for any human being to fulfill the law in, the, in its perfection? Absolutely not. So here's the law that says, this is the moral law of God, that if you want to relate to God, you have to be perfect, like your father is perfect. Can't do that. It's impossible. But let me give you one who's able to do that for you. Who is this one? Well, he's one of you. He's one like you. And Paul the Apostle is going to discover this. I, 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 I imagine that Paul the Apostle is, is studying these things with Gamaliel and all these things and paying money to study perhaps and all these years and all of that. And then he says, ah, I came to nothing. I don't want to. All of that stuff. Oh, I just want to know. I just want to know him. And, so, and I want to have his righteousness. The righteousness that is through faith. By faith in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the point of why he became. It was necessary not only for the Savior to be born under the law. But it was necessary for the Savior to, 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 to actually go to the cross and to die. So that with his blood he will purchase your salvation. My salvation. But it was the blood of Jesus Christ. Knowing that we were redeemed not with silver, not with gold, not with any other perishable thing, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So that when John the Baptist sees the Lamb, he says, oh, here's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It's not just the covering of the sin for one year. It's the taking away completely the name of Jesus, the, the person of Jesus Christ. What's the person of Jesus Christ? Who is he? The work of Jesus Christ. What did he do? 
He came to redeem. He came to save. Why? He had to, he had to have a physical, a human body. He had to take on human nature in order for him to go and die. Can we nail the Father to the cross? Absolutely not. Why? Because he is what? His spirit. But we have the Son. And, and, the, and Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. But it had to be in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, go to the book of Hebrews, please, if you don't mind. Chapter 10. By what act of God was he, Jesus, in the womb of Mary? I don't know how he did it, but I know why he did it. And then he tells me here in Hebrews the reason. And it's just amazing. As you read this and, and, and meditate on this truth, chapter 10 in the, in the book of, I was going to say the gospel of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. I'm telling you, I need another gallon of coffee. One of these days we're going to have coffee in here. Will you, will you be okay with that? Wouldn't that be beautiful? We're going to have some tables, we're going to have some coffee. Oh, Pastor Steve is already going like this. <laughs> I was just kidding, man. Hebrews 10, verse 5. Actually, I'm going to read from verse 1 because we want to get the context here. Hebrews 10, verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. We know that. All these sacrifices, and still they cannot be made perfect. Verse 2. For then will they not have ceased to be offered? Yeah. For the worshipers, once purified, will have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, verse 3, there is a reminder of sins every year. We know that that's, that was the case with the Old Testament uh, uh, economy. Year after year, sacrifice after sacrifice, and it's always the same. For you still have conscience of your sinful uh, situation. For it is not possible, verse 4, that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he, who is the he? Christ, when Jesus came into the world, Jesus said, sacrifice and offering you did not what? Desire, but a body you have prepared for me. Ladies and gentlemen, what is the implication of that when Jesus said, I, I, I know. As a father, uh, all these sacrifices year after year, and the attitude is getting worse and worse, by the way. You know that, right? At first, it was something like, oh, yeah, I, I know my sin and all of that. After the second year and third year and fourth year, oh, yeah, we just got to go. It's just like going to church on Sunday morning. Oops, I shouldn't have said that, huh? <laughs> Maybe that was not for today. But you know that the attitude, you know for sure that the attitude is not there always. I got to go to church, and I have to, and this is just a problem. You get all the kids ready, and it's just the fighting with the husband. And who's going to drive? And why didn't you put gas in the car yesterday? Now we have to stop the gas there. And now where are we going to go eat? And all these things. And you went to church, and what happened? I don't know. It was a terrible day. And that was the attitude with people going and presenting sacrifice. You understand what he's saying here? It says it got to the point when it was, it was just fed up with all these sacrifices, with, with the honor of the lips, and yet the heart was never there. It was never there. And so Jesus says, hey, I see this, and I get this. He says the, the, the sacrifices and the offers, that, that you didn't desire that because there was no essence, there was no meaning, there was no, there was no truth behind that. And this is a father you have prepared a body for me. And that's the beauty of Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. You prepare a body for me. And then notice what he says. But a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I say, behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. That's incarnation. That's the beauty of incarnation. 
It is Jesus who says, no, 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 nonsense. Not, you're not going nowhere. You're getting nothing done with those sacrifices. But by the way, they're false. They are fake. There's no good in it. I have to do this for you. Father, prepare a body for me. I'll do this. Why are you going to do it? Because of that. No, 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 no. I want to do this to please you. It is your pleasure. It's the desire of my heart. But there will be suffering. There will be pain. There will be rejection. They will mock you. There will be. I'll do it because it is your pleasure to say this. What are you about to do for these people? I'm about to go down there. Be one of them. And to live with them. And to teach these people. There is a way to live a life that really honors you. That really is about pleasing you. Not with all the distractions. Not well, what about me. What, I just want to be happy. Now I don't want to have this. None of that stuff. But I will endure the pain. And I will say, and I will fix my eyes on the cross. As I know that I have to go to the cross. Because that is what pleases you. You never come to know Jesus Christ if you don't get an understanding of what the incarnation is all about. And the sinfulness, I mean the sinfulness of the nature. And then the sinless life of Jesus Christ. And his righteousness that is accredited to your account. By faith in his name. By trusting what he said that he was going to do. He came to do. And all oh, that he accomplished that for you. And that he sealed the whole deal with the precious blood of the beloved Son of God. The Son of the Highest. The Son of God. The Holy One in the womb of that young lady, a virgin by the name of Mary. How much did she know about these things? Oh, she knew a whole bunch of stuff. You read chapter 1 in the Gospel of Luke, verse 46 to 51, and it's just an amazing thing. She, she must have been 16 or 17 years old, yet her understanding of God and her in intimacy with God, with what she had available of the scriptures of her day, it just blows you away as she is so real when it comes to the person and the presence of God in her life. I wonder why the Bible describes her as you favor of the Most High God. Turn to your left in Hebrews chapter 4. Is it 11 or 9.30 still? You know what I realized the other day? That, that, that the time on that thing is, is not right. And I, I checked the other day and said, Pastor Steve, why is this? He says, hopefully we'll get you to finish on time. You know, it's good to have friends. Chapter 4, book of Hebrews, verse 11. By the way, is, is Hebrews one of your favorite books in the Bible? Who, 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 yeah? It's just amazing, huh? And so is Genesis and Revelation and Gospel of Mark and Gospel of John and Jude and Esther. And I know some, and the Song of Songs and all of those books. Let us therefore be diligent, verse 11, to enter the rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and it is discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his side, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him whom we must give account. Seeing then that we have a high priest... Check this out. Who has passed through the heavens. What does that mean? That he came from heaven. Came from heaven to earth. Passed through the heavens. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Here we go. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet what? Without sin. And that's the beautiful thing about the incarnation. Now, like I, like I, like I did with first service, I, I just want to throw this out to you. Just kind of like to mess up your thinking a little bit before you go home. Because let me just put the question out there. And that's what I was thinking yesterday when Tibor said, what's wrong with you? I go like, I'm thinking about this thing. I mean, I don't even know how to put it in words. 
Now, for the purpose of transparency, I have to give you this because this is a, a well-known uh, uh, things. These are well-known things that are going out in, in Christian circles when it comes to the inheriting the sinful nature, that that sin nature that we inherit from Adam. And I just want to give you this because they're going nowhere with this thing other than what the Bible says. And they don't even mention that. But here's the question. If Jesus received what you call the substance from Mary, his mother, if he received that substance from Mary, Mary said that she was in need of a savior. What, that, what does that make her? A sinner. If Jesus received substance, substance from Mary, his mother, and we're talking about his hum, human nature here, okay? Then you will think that Mary's sinful nature will be passed along to Jesus, as it is, with the, case, as it is the case with all human beings. Do we agree on that? If she says that she's a sinner, and that she will have Jesus in her womb, then it will be logical to think that she will pass that sinful nature to Jesus in her womb. Does that make sense? So that created a whole bunch of problems for people here. Out of that, out of that theological question here come two schools of thought. One is called creationism. The other one is called traditionism. <laughs> to make things worse, huh? Traditionism says this, that the whole body and soul is transmitted from the parents to their progeny through the natural process of birth. Meaning, the moment the sperm hits the egg, there is the embryo, the moment of conception, that sinful nature goes through them from the parents. The soul comes at that moment. The sperm hits the egg, it comes with the soul at, right at that moment. That's one school of thought. The other one is called creationism and argues this, that every time a human being is born, meaning the sperm is hitting the egg, there's the embryo, at that particular moment, these guys say, they argue that that person is a new creation by the immediate and direct power of God's creativity. You follow what I'm saying? One school says the father and the mother, the sperm and the egg, once those are fertilized, that's the word I think, at that moment, the soul and the spirit come with that, and it, is, it comes from the parents. The other said no. The parents do their part, but at the moment that the, that the sperm fertilizes the egg, God creates a brand new soul at that moment. And that person is a new creation by the power and the direct creativity of God, who is almighty. I kind of like lean on that a little bit more than the other. Because the whole, this, and, and you're looking at me like, is he okay? No, I'm not okay. I know this is, this is difficult to understand, but I, I say this with this intention. Then here comes the Catholic Church. They said, oh, we're going to solve this issue. We got the answer for this thing. And I'm not mocking, I'm not making fun of them. I, I want to be very respectful. But they said, we're going to solve the issue. They came up with an even more complicated view and this, this is the doctrine that they call the Immaculate Conception of Mary. What is the Immaculate Conception of Mary? You all know that. What is the meaning of that? That Mary was free of original sin from the moment of her conception. Wait a minute. Now you're just making things worse here. First of all, yeah, they never read Luke's Gospel chapter 1, verse 46 to 51, because Mary says that she needed a Savior. Out goes the Immaculate Conception of Mary here. Not biblical, not true, completely not true. So then what, 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 what do we do? We are left with this problem here. How is it then that the problem we're going to be solved here? Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. A son was given. Where was he before? With the father. How do we know? John's Gospel, chapter 1, in the beginning was the, who is the word? Jesus. And they say this because they say, no, 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 wait, wait, wait a minute. Still, how are you going to explain that Jesus is sinless when he was born of a woman who was a sinner? Ha <laughs> ha, easy. They say, no, no, it had to be the virgin birth that will keep Jesus sinless. No. Huh? You don't believe that the virgin birth was necessary for Jesus to be sinless? No. 
Because my Jesus existed from the very beginning with the Father. And in order for him to be the word, he had to be sinless. And I know that he is sinless because he is God. And the Father said that Jesus is God. Jesus says that he is God. The Holy Spirit says that he is God. Good enough for me. I don't need to come up with another thing or invent any other thing here. I can't anyway. So the virgin birth of Jesus Christ does not make Jesus sinless. God could have used any way he wanted. I mean, for him to bring Jesus into the world, he said it here. You have prepared a body for me, for he already existed. Oh, John says that he became flesh, meaning he changed his condition from being one with the Father. Yep, mm -hmm, the Son, the second person of the Trinity. I know that. Deity, yep, mm-hmm. And then he was born from a woman, which gives Jesus his humanity. His humanity determines not his deity. You know that. So this, the, the, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ does not determine that he is divine. What determines that he is divine is God himself saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Amen. Does that make sense? So what's the point of the incarnation? Oh, the God in his grace and mercy looks at your condition, my condition, and says, there's only one way, and there's only one exclusive way to save these people. Son, I have prepared a body for you. And he says, yes, I will go and be one of them. I will go and live with them. I will go and suffer like they suffer, and cry like they cry, and thirst like they thirst, and I will go and be one of them. And I will die for their sins. And daddy, I will bring them back to you. And the father said, he is my beloved son. And in him I am well pleased. Isn't that amazing? That's the Bible, people. And that is what the incarnation is. Now, this is only half of the point here, okay? Next week, we're going to have to cover the other half because this is just amazing. When you start to believe that, okay, I don't understand the methodology, but I know the means. Why did he want to do it? He did it all to save me. And with that, I am okay. And I am thankful. I cannot explain it. And to tell you the truth, with all the biblical evidence I have, I can only try to give you this thing. If I confuse you, please forgive me. If I didn't confuse you, I will do it again next week. And... <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, oh, we praise you. We thank you. Oh, Lord, you are amazing. How majestic your ways. Oh. How ridiculous it is for our finite minds to try to understand the infinite God of the universe. And yet you didn't want us to know all of those things. You gave us Jesus. You gave us Jesus. And he came. And he died. And he rose again. And he went to prepare a place. And one of the most beautiful words out of his mouth. I will go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you. I'm coming to take you. Oh, we are longing for the moment. Then and only then, all of these questions are going to fade away. Then and only then in his presence, we'll actually have no questions of our own. But just a deep desire to praise him and to worship him and the beauty of his majesty. And that we will take eternity to say thank you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for living a sinless life. And you did it for me. You did it for us. And we thank you. Send us home rejoicing now that we know Jesus, the sinless one, the son of the highest, the son of God, the holy one, Jesus, our savior. Jesus, Jesus, our king. Send us home rejoicing now. For that's the truth, and that settles everything in life, in this life, and all the lives to come. For we are your people, and you are our God. And we praise you in Jesus' name.